Hey, hey, ooh, ooh, woo. Welcome to Jazz After Dark here tonight. How you doing? Hope all is good. Got something to drink? You ready to learn something with me? Enjoy the Breckenridge bourbon again, this time in a circular glass that has this weird like finger holdy thing there. I wonder what that could be for. You guys realize I know exactly what that does, right? I'm not a dummy. Gosh, can't take a a joke, a little sarcasm out there. Anyways, we're going to talk about a little bit of portfolio construction tonight and um, really focus around dividends. And I'm going to base this on a class that I did for clients once I get my foot out of there um, because it, it's kind of relevant again. Um, and we're financial advisors here at Jazz Wealth and we build our own portfolios. So I'm going to share some of the stuff that I uh, would take into consideration as well when, when doing this. Uh, what's becoming more popular is um, dividend funds. So you're paying a lot of dividends, right? And you got to be careful with dividend funds because you could easily be skewed too heavily towards you, the utility sector or even energy. It's getting better by the, by the day, really, because the energy stocks are just you know, they don't want to invest in uh, drilling for more oil and stuff. So they're just paying back uh, in the form of dividends and buying back their shares. So uh, aside from that, let's assume you want to be diverse. What do we have to do to build a dividend portfolio? You come to me, you say, Dustin, build me something cu uh, custom or you're out there trying to do it yourself. Well, first thing you want to do is set some criteria. You're going to look for any stock that fits your criteria, maybe you're focused on small caps or maybe some mid caps or whatever. Um, I'm just going to use the S&P today because it's really easy and I find that I could sort of guide you without getting in trouble from the SEC by giving you specific advice. And so this would be the most helpful to you while keeping my lights on and not getting in trouble from the SEC, which is on a tear lately, by the way. They just went after LPL and LPL says the fines that they're going to have to pay they just know that they're going to impact their earnings, uh, but they can't say by how much. They may even have to show a loss. It's a horrible thing, but you know they didn't do anything wrong. But uh, in as far as the rules go, okay, technically they've been letting some things slide. They're not a bad company. I should say it that way. If you get fined by the SEC, it doesn't mean you're a bad company. You just didn't follow the exact freaking rule down to a T. Thankfully, we have not been fined. Right. Uh, okay. Side side topic there. Step number one: build a list. Um, I, in today's example, I'm going to use now. This is from a class, right? So these numbers will change a little bit. I'm going to say um, I would like every stock in the S and P that yields at least 1.3 percent. And that's not hard to come by these days, but you get what I'm saying. You just got to pick a number. You could say maybe 3% these days. If the list is too large, and you say, I don't want to buy that many stocks, raise the amount to 4% or whatever. That's your first criteria. You got it? Now, oh, by the way, this applies to anything. Maybe you're not focused on dividends, but you say, I'm interested in the, in the greatest total return. Show me, uh, you, mean you would just look on any scanner or your platform or whatever. Show me stocks that have the greatest total return over the last three years. Right? So we, we just have a starting point, and in our case today, it's dividends. What else do we need? Think about that for a second. It's a distraction. We know the dividend. That's what we're interested in. Is there anything else that we could sweeten the pot with just a little bit? Again, pretend that you're me. So you... Um, you're going to pretend that you're me. Uh, you, you say, uh, uh, Dustin's come to me and Dustin has entrusted me to you to manage a uh, million dollars. I want the highest dividend yield, but I don't want to be riding a Bronco, so to speak, to get that dividend yield. In other words, I'm willing to leave some stocks out that maybe still fit the criteria, but I don't want this wild swinging dividend fund. A great example is if you started this year, 2023, and you said, 
I want the highest dividend paying sector. Well, that would be utilities. So if you bought all the stocks in the utility sector, you would be down about 6.6% .6 at the moment. That doesn't offset your dividend. Your full year dividend is like 3.3%. I wonder if I can show that without messing this up. So what good would that do? You would be very, very upset by that. Actually, I can show that. Uh, and I almost got those numbers spot on, I'll have you know. Right? So let's see. This is going to be a little bit sloppy for a second. I'll make it clean. Here is the year-to-date performance of each sector, including the S&P. It's a day or two old. Uh, but also, the blue includes their dividend yield. So in black, we have the year-to-date performance as of the other day. Consumer discretionary, as referenced by the XLY, 12% but it only pays 1%. You could care less, right? You're up 12%. I'll take the extra one. That's happy. But like I said a second ago, if you said I want the highest yielding sector, at least at the start of the year, that would have been utilities. You're down 6.6%. Uh-oh. Right? What good would that do you? You would be very upset by that. So oftentimes we don't look at the individual sectors. Okay. Side topic there. I ranted a little bit, even got a little off topic. Let's get back on a, a sketch here. So number one, we're finding the list of the universe that we're willing to choose from. In my case, uh, this is what I put together. I need to get this where you can see it, and that's good enough. The next thing I did is I said, I would like to see them visually by their volatility. So on the x-axis here, we have the total yield at the time. And so it ranges from maybe, well, we know 1.3 is the cutoff and goes all the way up to 7.9 or whatever that was at the time. I took the stocks away. Please don't kill me. I, I can't, I get in trouble if I share specific picks. So don't hate me. I'm going to teach you still. All right. So now we look at this and we say, wow, that's actually quite a difference here. Um, I'll just go buy this one. Well, a portfolio does not consist of one stock, and also that would give you a lot of individual corporate risk. We don't want to do that. Remember, just a second ago, I said, I'm entrusting you to manage a million dollars for me. Don't you dare go put it all in one stock, right? You'd be fired. I would find a nice way to say it, but you'd be fired. Okay, so you say, well, for the same yield, actually, maybe a little bit better, uh, and less volatility, I could buy these two stocks and I could figure out how much I need to buy of each so that the total yield is the same or better. I know that these two ever so slightly would have lower volatility because this guy is lower than this guy. So this is super elementary at the moment. Stay with me. You could also start to group in a handful of these. Yes, these three are more volatile than these six right here. But if I could take a blended equal weighted portfolio, maybe yield of say 6.8%, I'd be willing to do that. So now what you're going to do with your list is visually you can see, this is just a simple scatter plot, but you could kind of see where you're going to need to play. You can get really geeky and dive in deeper and segment all of them. I don't know how math oriented you guys are, but you could segment them and say, show me the lowest yielding high, I'm sorry, the highest yielding lowest volatility stocks that at least have a, a yield of 1.3%, got to be better than that. But I want to build a portfolio with the least amount of volatility. Okay. And then you could play with it and say, well, it has to include at least 10 stocks, 20 stocks, whatever it is. I just put this together visually for you. And you say, okay, well, this is my group. Okay. So let's erase all of these, these stocks, or if we were to look at it, these stocks have higher volatility for the same yields as these, generally speaking. These stocks over here have lower yields and the lowest volatility. So you might say, if, if I were 85 years old and could not afford any risk, but I still needed to make something, and I shouldn't say any risk, I want the lowest possible risk, and I don't care what the yield is, I just need something, you'd be drawing from here. If you, this would be the silliest section for you to be in because you'd be saying, I'm willing to take more volatility, more whipsaw, more back and forth for the same total dividend that the people that are taking it easy and just sort of coasting through are getting. I don't want that. That's ridiculous. Okay. 
So this is our sweet spot if we're trying to solve for the highest yield and lowest volatility. Now from here, we can pluck all of these stocks out and do one extra thing. What is it? Oh, you're not here. You can't guess. What if all of those stocks were in the utility sector? Would you be okay with that? I, you, again, gave me the million dollars. You said, go ahead and invest it. And I said, okay, well, here's the lowest volatility, highest yield I can get you, but it's all in the utility sector. I don't think I would take that. We just showed that on the previous slide. Uh, it's not going very well right now, and that's offsetting my total yield. So the next step is to make sure you have the diversity that you're looking for, all right? And again, this is just me trying to take something super complex and start with a baseline so that if you like this video, we can expand on it from here. So that's, that's the step. Number one, find what your criteria is. And if you're building a portfolio, I don't want to say benchmark, but, but plot it against volatility. Then take the total number of positions you're willing to have and segment your scatter plot, or if you just have a list or whatever, sort the list. You know, I'm just being fancy, but you sort the list by the top 20, whatever it is you want to invest in that meet that criteria. And then finally, the last thing you'd want to do is make sure it's diverse. Unless your goal was not to be diverse, right? You could, remember this right here, we're using the S&P. You could do the same thing. It'd be a whole lot less symbols, but you could say, uh, in the real estate sector, let's play the same game. You just have a lot less positions to choose from, but you could very quickly weed out the ones that you may not want anything to do with. Okay. Another thing you can do, I'm now I'm just getting crazy. Uh, another thing you could do is analyze these and see if there's any growth inside of there. Can Because you can imagine, right? These stocks have a lower yield and lower volatility, it's not likely that any of those are going to be growth stocks. You know why? They would rank higher in volatility. Typically, a growth stock that pays a lower dividend or any dividend at all tends to be more volatile. You accept that risk when you accept the, the returns or hopeful returns, right? So you could kind of branch out from there. So this is just kind of a, a little sample of like how I start putting things together in the most general sense. Please nobody think that this is the game that I play on a daily basis, but in the most general sense, I'm only asking a few questions and then the geekiness can start from there. Now, um, I, I took a shot, right? Let's compare your, if you were to put together a dividend portfolio, right, would it beat that? And I'm not trying to be egotistical. I'm trying to get you to think, right? So would it beat that? If we both had to find the highest yielding, lowest volatile, volatility portfolio that we could build, I'm going to beat you all day long, right? Because you'd, you'd have to do the same research. We could end up with the same portfolio, of course. But what's one last thing that we can do? If I found that you built something that was maybe a little bit better than mine, what did you likely do to, to get that performance? We haven't mentioned anything about the weighting of these positions. If let's say there's, uh, uh, no, there's probably what, 20? Uh, let's just say there's 20. So let's say there's 20 positions down here and I want to uh, build a portfolio out of them. I got to ask how much is going into each. If I put 2% into one, 10 into the other, could I not skew the portfolio a little bit? Of course, right? And I'm sorry, that neon thing pops up every time we're doing this. Um, so for example, if there were 100 positions and I put 1% into each, that'd be called an equal weighted portfolio. In other words, I gave none of them a, a you know sort of priority over the other. But if I found that you were beating that, could I not just say, let's go 6% in all of these up here? at the on the bottom side here and maybe even these two right here and then let's distribute the rest evenly across here again assuming there's a you know 50 positions or 30 percent whatever it is so you can now start to play the game of juicing up your total yield you're going to become more focused of course you have more dollars in one position of course but you could now start to juice up the yield so at the end of the day why does one dividend mutual fund beat the other it's a one word answer is risk. 
They're taking more risk, but you don't see that risk because they all chose the same stocks. Look at how they've allocated those uh, dollars towards each position. If I needed to keep my job at a mutual fund company, I was managing a dividend portfolio, and turns out T. Rowe Price's fund was beating everybody else, I would look at how they were allocated and say, do my investors, would they notice if I got a little bit heavier in the top 10 positions? Hmm? Now take that same thing and go to the S&P as a whole. The S&P, when people tell you you can't beat the S&P, it's just a math model. It's a human driven math model. Could you not just change your allocation just a little bit, accept more risk, but could you not show a different return just simply by allocating differently? Um, it's tougher on the S&P. In the Russell 2000, just the last little side topic here. In the Russell 2000, it's very easy to do because no one, no mutual fund actually, when you say I'm buying the Russell 2000 index fund, well, you're not buying the index, a little trade secret for you you're not even buying half the index because they can't. If there's so much money in an index fund, take the you know Vanguard small cap fund, whatever it is. If they take all your dollars, these guys have more money than you could ever imagine. They can't go buy the 1999th small cap stock that would be in there. I don't know what it is because it may only trade 2000 shares a day. So they can't buy it, right? They would be manipulating the stock and breaking the rules of a mutual fund. So instead they do something called sampling, which is even more human driven than just the index itself. So humans build portfolios to sample or mimic the index and they can do that and it works. So the, when people say you can't beat the S and P, um, okay, maybe you can't cause you don't want to. But is it mathematically possible? Of course, it's, it's a model, right? So I always find that, uh, and you can debate that with me if you like, but I always find that those people are like, okay, your thoughts come from an article that has no description at all. Like there's nobody that actually goes into detail there to explain why that's not the case. Um, but you know, you read, you see things on the internet and you believe them. Like me, you're watching me on the internet. <laughs> All right. Anyways, I'm done rambling. I, again, this was just a test, kind of like a general video. I'm just, we're throwing things out, see what sticks. If you like it, we'll carry it on to the next level, the next level, next level, whatever. And uh, keep diving in from there. Hope it got you thinking a little bit. That's really all I care about. If you're thinking about how to improve your dollars by just that much, just a little bit more. That's it. That's really all I'm asking for. In addition to that. <laughs> All right. I'm out of here. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Have a great rest of your week and uh, we'll see you soon. Adios.